I'm Mike Gawley. I'm a broadcaster and a bit of an elder statesman around disability issues. It's something that I've lived with and worked with for probably 30 or so years now. Um, having been born with a physical impairment, it wasn't really until my late teens, early 20s, I got involved as a disabled person in affairs that had to do with other disabled people. And actually it made me realise what I'd missed out on. Uh, because even though it was great that I was mainstreamed and that you know, I went through school, regular school, what I had missed out on, I realised, was just being with other disabled people from time to time. And it's really neat when you're with people that there's something about you understand the score, you know what the deal is, you don't have to justify yourself or feel like you're the only one that's different. I'd always been a bit coy about going to public swimming pools because I just often couldn't be bothered with all the comments and the sort of pointing and whatever, or even if I was only imagining it, it was certainly very, in my mind, it was actually something that made me think twice before I would go to a pool. But anyway, there's about 30 of us on this camp and we waddled and crawled into this particular pool at Pleasant Point. And we'd cleared that pool in about three seconds flat. Everyone else was out of it. And we thought it was great. You know, strength in numbers and all that. So that was something that made me realise just the value of actually working in disability issues and thinking about those more systemic barriers to being able to lead a full and productive life. My name is Mary O'Hagan and I'm sitting here today because I was admitted to a psychiatric hospital 30 years ago. I was very affected by my mental health problems for about eight or nine years between my late teens and my mid to late twenties. That really got me interested in doing advocacy work um, after I became stable again. I realised how ineffective the services had been. Since I've been an advocate, I've done a lot of international work, as well as local and national work in New Zealand. I've done, um, been in advisory roles with the World Health Organisation and the United Nations. Uh, I've been a consultant and managed peer support organisations. And um, in more recent years, I was a mental health commissioner my big interest really in talking here today is to um, appeal to journalists um, not to discriminate. As a broadcaster, and because I do a particular uh, programme around disability issues, I've always been interested in how to frame stories around disability issues. And one of the things that's been core to the way I do things is to have people who have the direct and lived experience of a particular condition or attribute or disability or whatever actually have the voices of people with that direct lived experience as the, the, if you like the, the, the kind of the integral part of a story. The community consequences of not talking to the most important stakeholders which are the people who've been through the system uh, is that it just reinforces the the myth that these people are silent and don't have anything to say. Uh, when in fact, um, uh, people who've been through these experiences have got an awful lot to say. Now some of them may not want to say it publicly and that's got to be respected, but there are a good number of people around who are prepared to share their stories. And that might be people moving into a neighbourhood and uh, looking to how they might be included in the community. And so you've got the reaction often of prospective neighbours and again you've got a lot of comment coming from people who say that this might raise an increased risk to the safety of people in that particular neighbourhood. So again on mainstream media you might get um, a you know well-known psychiatrist or you might get someone who is a family member or one of the neighbours or whoever to talk about what it means to them for this to be happening and sometimes the well-meaning psychiatrist will you know be all in favour of the fact that this should be happening but for me it's really important to find out well what do people who've got the direct lived experience of mental illness think about this issue. My lived experience is the most important um, um, influence in my work but not just that um, what I'd call a, a particular analysis of it as well, because I don't think you can just have plain lived experience without interpretation. So you've got the, the ex-murderer coming, coming to live next door to you kind of stuff, trying to really 
dissolve some of that thinking around what it means to have a person with the experience of mental illness living next door to you and hear from people and find out in fact you know that like any group of people you've got a different range of people with different interests different ideas and that they are in fact um, as much as anyone like you. Most common responses to madness from people who don't haven't had much contact with it is um, f pity or fear. Okay, and th they're just they're just um, unrealistic and un unhelpful responses. Basically, uh, feeling pity for people is an insult, and actually fearing people is uh, not realistic because actually people with mental health problems are more likely to be the victims of crime than the perpetrators of any sort of violence or anything like that. One of the things about journalism, or one of the myths about journalism, is that it's some objective science, and that somehow journalists can remove themselves from a situation where, as as ordinary people, if they weren't in their role as journalists or media people, would probably have many of the fears, many of the uncertainties that people do, because we do have these images of what it means to be mentally ill. We do have the popular culture, which is pretty strong. Everything from the movie Psycho right through to you know Jim Carrey and me, myself, and I, and Irene, or whatever it was called, you know, which had really perpetrated a lot of stereotypes and, and wrong thinking around what it means to have a particular kind of mental illness. We all grow up with that. So I think it's a bit silly to think that suddenly as a journalist, as a, as a media person, that you can remove yourself from all of that when you're thinking about a story that involves people with an experience you just don't have any knowledge of. Which I think is why it's more important then to go to people who've had that experience. But the other thing I think is to simply acknowledge to yourself that you do have come up with those fears and those uncertainties and that, that imagery that's so present in our, in our culture and in our media generally. For anyone who's been through a, a psychotic or uh, you know an experience of very, um, very sort of um, extreme mental health problems, um, what you're experiencing is, is an incredibly profound experience that can't be anything else. And the pathological view just doesn't fit with that experience. So one of the things that the user survivor movement has done is really kind of not to romanticise that experience because it's it's profoundly distressing a lot of the time for people, but it's still a profound experience. And so what, what the movement has done is to um, say, look, this experience needs to be respected. I have to bear in mind when it comes to my colleagues working in the newsroom or in the, you know, in the, in the, on the papers, whether it's paper, radio or television or whatever, mm. that there is a real constraint about time. But I think there are some things that we can get right that don't have anything to do with time. Language is a really important one. It's very easy to just think about the language that you use and decide that you're going to use language that does not perpetrate stereotypes. So for instance, when referring to someone as um, being in two minds about something, why do we have to say it's schizophrenic? Because that's not about schizophrenia at all. Um, if we're talking about people who happen to have that diagnosis, why can't we talk about people who live with that particular condition or have that diagnosis? Why do we have to refer to people as schizophrenics? Why do we have to people refer to people as manic depressives? All that language that reduces people down to a diagnosis, it's really silly. So to me, that's nothing about time, that's something about attitude, that's something saying, look, there is language around which reduces people and stigmatises people, and there's language that is accurate, honest, and still feeling that we can use instead. So let's look at the kind of language we use. You could have a label of being a genius. Well, you know, um, no one's going to complain, well, I don't know, but no one's going to complain too much about that. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's where the labels position you in the social order of things that is the, is the important thing. And of course, labels associated with mental illness um, put your way down the, the hierarchy of human um, condition and experiences. So that's, that's the problem with them. Um, another problem, of course, is that they come from a very medical perspective. And, um, and that's really one of the things that helps p 
place them very low down on the on the hierarchy. I mean, it's very complex with labels too because um, we call ourselves nutters and um, loonies and mad people. It's a bit like the reclaimed language that, um, you know, it's like gay people who say we're queers or black people who call themselves niggers. I mean, it's a, it's a way of reclaiming language that has been used against us. Um, we wouldn't be so happy if the media used those terms in the traditional derogatory way. If you got that right, you'd be well on your way to doing better stories, stories that actually people can think and reflect on, rather than using the very shorthand, shortcut descriptions that actually do damage to the story. They do damage to the integrity of the story because in fact it, it distorts what's really happening. Interviewing people in distress, um, I mean, does require a lot more sensitivity than interviewing a, uh, a bureaucrat who's hiding information. It needs to be an automatic uh, response from any journalist covering any mental health story that they seek out a person who comes from that lived experience perspective.